Welcome to the Power of Owning Your Career podcast, the show for women who are seeking more fulfillment in life and simply not getting it from their current situation. We focus specifically on careers, but hey, we spend a lot of time in our careers, so making changes here will definitely create an impact in your overall happiness. I'm your host, Simone Morris, and my mission is to empower women to succeed. I believe that in order to powerfully own your career, you must decide and claim that you want to sit in the driver's seat. You must know that you deserve better and be willing to not only do the requisite work, but be willing to go out on a limb to ensure your success. Each episode focuses on profiling a leader who is clearly demonstrating ownership of their career. Join me and my guests as we explore career journeys and bring you actionable strategies to use to get into the driver's seat for your career. Because ultimately, your career is your responsibility. Let's get into the show. Hi, it's Simone Morris chiming in for this week's episode of the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. The first thing I want to say is that this episode is a wonderful episode, lots of nuggets, valuable nuggets from from our guest. It is a little long, I want you to know that, but that's okay. Just take some time and make sure you take some notes and it's actionable steps that you can take in owning your career. So be motivated and inspired by this week's episode. The other thing that I want to mention is that this week is the Power of Owning Your Career Experience event. It's going to be on Saturday, April 20th at the Serendipity Labs in Stanford, Connecticut. It is going to be off the chart, so I want you to come through and really get into the driver's seat for your career. I've got amazing panelists lined up to inspire you, amazing content, and by the way, you get to get your headshot done on site, a professional headshot that you can use in your career. So please go ahead and sign up for the event. Go to my website, simonemorrisenterprises.org, and you will see a link to the upcoming event. Without further ado, I want to turn you over to this week's guest of the podcast. Do enjoy. In today's episode of the Power of Owning Your Career podcast, I am pleased to have Althea Bates join us for a wonderful conversation. Althea is a womanpreneur, a coach, an author, a speaker, you name it, she's it. And she is definitely in the driver's seat. So Althea, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Simone. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Let's get right into it. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're currently doing. Okay, so it's it's overwhelming to think about all the things that I'm doing, but I, I'll definitely share and give give her higher okay. a higher level a highlights. Um, so I actually am, um, you know, um, my my two main things that I do is I actually run a, a nonprofit for women of color called um, Project Resiliency Movement. So it's a it's a movement that social movement that I started because I was actually trying to find spaces safe spaces for women of color um, where I, I could actually, when I was actually going through my own self-care and resiliency journey, it was hard to find those spaces for myself. Um, you know, when I was trying to heal from my brokenness and when I was actually physically healing um, from, you know, medical issues in terms of having two broken legs, trying to find healing and wellness spaces, it was hard to find those spaces that I felt comfortable in that also represented my narrative. So I created those. I decided and made the decision to create the space. Um, and so it's a safe space for women of color to actually gather, to come support each other. So we do conferences, seminars, workshops, et cetera, you name it, all focused on the areas of resiliency and self-care. So for example, we, last November, we did a self-care symposium. We had over 250 women attending. We had everything under the sun you could think of for self-care. We had demos, self-care demos. We had self-care vendors, um, self-care workshops. Um, it, you know, it was um, a self-care panel. We had self-care salons where people could have smaller you know, um, group conversations about their own self-care and their self-care journey and process. It was an amazing day, an amazing event. But that's just to give you an example of the type of events that we host um, to bring women of color into a space where they can gather together, where they can support each other, where they can share similar narratives and and, and come from a space of understanding of of, of those narratives and how to heal from those narratives um, when need be. Is this nationally? Where do the women come from? Is this Connecticut? It is, it, I, I started and launched this in Connecticut and it's been amazing. Like, honestly, it's been like a, a, a burst and, and, and a, a trailblazer of its own. 
Um, so I started in, in good old small Connecticut and um, I've been traveling across the country, um, you know, kind of sharing this um, whole idea of healing um, and wellness um, for, around resiliency and self-care for women of color. Um, I've been invited to speak nationally um, and, also, and also now internationally. I'll be traveling to Africa um, oh, at end of this wonderful. year. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, that spawn or, or what, what it's kind of moved into as well is it, 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 you know, because we had those, those smaller spaces and people were kind of gravitating to needing more time um, um, to really have those discussions and asking, hey, can we actually have a weekend, not just a day, not just a half a day conference, not just a whole day conference, not just a circle or a meetup or a forum, um, but can we have like a longer extended period of time to engage in these discussions, support each other? Um, you know, for, for us to be poured into in terms of, you know, um, you know, the coaching and wellness work that I do. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of led to me, um, with a part of mine launching, um, a black wellness retreat, um, black women's leaders retreat. So we'll actually be launching that in Spain. I'm so excited for oh, October of 2019. Wonderful. How, yeah. Althea, how do you do it all? Because <laughs> let me understand this. Do you have a daughter that is a kidpreneur as well? Yes, I'm a momager. I'm a mo- oh. <laughs> I, I love these words that you've come up with. Oh my goodness. How do you do it all? Honestly, I, because I'm fueled from a place of passion um, and I'm passionate about creating social impact and I'm passionate about um, um, impacting people. I think that just kind of drives me. Like I, 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 that's my driver, my own adrenaline. It's, it's because I'm fueled by the work that I do and I'm satisfied. So, I, you know, when I, when the opportunity came um, and, and kind of just, you know, kind of say how I kind of got here. So I, in 2016, I launched Project Resiliency, but before that, seven years before that, I had launched um, a Bates Consulting and I was kind of part-time, part-timing in it you know, running, uh, uh, you know, uh, my own business, but, you know, on a part-time outside of my nine to five, working my nine to five, working around my nine to five, um, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I did consulting for nonprofits. I did consulting for, um, school systems. I actually was part, um, I ran a, um, a youth development practitioners Academy and a middle managers Academy for the city of Hartford. Um, so I was, I was picking up contracts and doing it around my nine to five. But again, all focused on the skill sets that I had. So my, my, co- my career trajectories has been around workforce development, youth development, um, case management. Um, and so my expertise, I was just kind of like shelling off and doing um, consulting work and, and, and kind of showing other people how to actually do this, train their staff in, in youth development practices, case management youth, and workforce development practices. Doing that, you know, kind of around the city. And um, I just kind of, you know, felt that, you know, there, there's, there's, there's more purpose in me, in me and for me to do. There's more purposeful work that I should be doing. Um, and I, I don't necessarily feel like I'm on task or I'm on target. And I had a very life-changing, impactful event that happened to me in 20, um, at 2009. I actually broke two legs in one year. Wow. And um, it was five months apart, exact same mirror breaks. And that, the beginning of that year, I began to ask God about purposing what my journey should be, what I'm here to do, what am I, what am I purpose on earth to be here to do? Um, and, uh, you know, I said, I'm intentionally setting out on this journey, God, and, and I want you to reveal it to me before the end of the year. I want to reveal what am I purpose here to do? Not just doing work, not just doing things in my community, because I was doing a lot of things um, and doing community supporting, supportive things and um, involved um, and, and, you know, had my own career trajectory and, and had successful career. But I was like, I need to do more than that. It's, I need to be on purpose and on task um, with what you want me to do, God. And I started like to kind of start that year. That was my resolution for the year. Um, and two weeks into that, I actually broke my first leg on black ice in my backyard. And I, I remember saying, God, I'm doing a lot of things. Because back then I was an adjunct professor. I've always been doing a lot of things. I was an adjunct professor. I actually was working a full-time job as a director of a nonprofit. And I was doing community work. Like I was sitting on boards and civic boards, um, community boards, and, you know, kind of really doing a lot of community involved work. And so I was, it wasn't like I wasn't involved in doing things. I just felt like I wasn't doing purposeful work for me, what I should be doing. And so I began that journey and, um, I said, God, you know, I'm doing a lot of things. I just need a break. My exact words were, I need a break to figure it out, God. I need a break to figure out what I should be on task and doing as opposed to what I'm currently just kind of doing. doing. 
Um, and two weeks after I prayed that prayer I, on black ice, I went outside. It was black ice. I broke my first leg and I was in the backyard freezing it before it was an hour before somebody came out and found me in my backyard. And I, it was just me and God. We had a conversation and I was like, God, why is, you know, why, why this, why me? And he said, you asked me at the beginning of the year to give you a break so you could, you could be in tune and find out what your purpose should be, what you're here, here and purpose to do. And I said, yes, I did intentionally ask you for that break, <laughs> but I did think it was going to be literal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and so um, that, was, that was the year. That, that was the year of breaks. And so the first part of the year, God showed me and, and, and taught me about brokenness um, and, um, and, and how to actually come back and heal from brokenness. And, and he, we broke off relationships. He bro- you know, broke me financially. Um, you know, I, I went into mental health and um, my mental health was affected. I you know, went through a bout of depression as a result of that experience. Um, and so I was broken in all these different areas. And he said, I'm breaking you. So whatever you're going through, it's me showing you because this, this is part of your purpose. It's part of the journey to what your purpose to do. And that happened the first part of the year. I was getting ready to go back to work. Doubt, so proud of myself. I just kind of I had to go through rehab, learn how to walk again. I just got down to my goal of one crutch. And it was Mother's Day weekend. And I was actually, you know, getting ready to, I drove myself to my mom's house for the first time in five months. And I'm so excited. And I remember, um, you know, getting ready to leave her kitchen. She was like, go sit, go sit down. And, you know, it, her floors were steamy. She had those marble floors and the crutches couldn't withstand it. Wow. I went up in the air again, came down, broke the second leg. And, got, and I said, I said, God, I thought I thought I had learned a lesson. I thought I was I'd learned, the, you know, I was learning the purpose for work was around brokenness, brokenness and helping people to heal from that through my own journey. And he said, no, that's only part of part of your work. The other part of the work is, is resiliency. You need to help people to not just own their brokenness and their baggage and the things that they're carrying, but you need to help them to, to, to be resilient, to overcome those things, so to overcome the, the word, things that they're going through. He gave resiliency. you the word resiliency. He and gave me resilience. the word resiliency That's and amazing. told me to study it, meditate, meditate on it, and to, and to, really, uh, and to really focus on it because my, my purposeful work will be tied to that word. word. Yeah, I just want to meditate on the moment of that, <laughs> I know. Sto- that powerful story because it, it just, it, you know, it almost signifies an opportunity to get into the driver's seat for your career, for shifting your focus for... And that, uh, yeah, that actually, that exactly was the, was the moment. That was the year that it shifted for me. And so that's why I wanted to share the story uh, uh, that, that was behind the creation of Project Resiliency Movement, because that was when its inception, that was when it was first poured into me um, and, and, and brought forth. And, I, and life happens, you know, God bless me, you know, with, with getting married again and having another child. And I started doctoral school and I got super busy. And God kept saying, hey, remember the resiliency work I gave you? Remember that word I gave you? Remember the work I told you to do with women around that? You know, the, the experience I gave you of brokenness to resiliency I need you to work on that with women. And he kept telling me that and telling me that. And sometimes we're totally disobedient and we, we don't fall in line with, with what God is telling us to do when we're supposed to do it. And I, you know, I was like, God, I'm, I'm going to be an authoritarian. God, you know, you've got me into doctoral school. You give me this opportunity. Let me finish up. I'm, I'm getting ready to do this research and, I, and I'm almost done. I'm in dissertation stage. Let me finish this up so I can actually become an authoritarian so then I can actually write, maybe write some books and do some lectures and I'll have doctor in front of my name and people will then respect me for the things I'm saying around resiliency and self-care and, and, you know, and having that expertise. And God said, no, I actually have credentialed you. I've poured it into you. I've given you the purpose. I need you to walk in that. You don't need a doctor in front of your name because I've already authorized you to go do the work. And he said, tell them you're not coming back. This is 2016, fast forward. He said, tell them you're not coming back to doctoral school. I was actually, I had just, I had submitted my um, dissertation for approval. I just got it approved. And in and, and the September, I was supposed to go back to school. This is August. He said, tell them you're not coming back. And, and, I, and I said, definitely. He said, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> and I said, okay. I, I, I called them and they were, they were in shock. They were like, where are you? Well, you, you, your research has been approved. Why, why would you stop now? And I said, I have to. I have to. I have other work I need to do. 
and he told me to launch a conference that year. In 2016, I launched on um, the first Project Resiliency Movement, the Resiliency Conference, and it was powerful. Women were healed. I didn't have enough Kleenex. Women were women re- were released from their brokenness. Um, they they let go, of, you know, let, let go of their baggage. People said they've never experienced an experience like that coming to an event. Um, people were, you know, let you know, came in as strangers and left, you know, kind of hugging each other, supporting each other, exchanging information. It was it was an amazing experience. I can't even replicate, you know, or, or, or kind of even share where the experience was. Like. You kind of have to be in a room to to see it for yourself. And um, you know, and and it just kind of like spawned this whole um, idea of, okay, people need to be connected. And so that, you know, we started doing like resiliency circles and other things to kind of connect women throughout the year. And then we had the major conference, um, you know, like that would happen that no- every November. And last year, guy was like, you know what, you need to take this on another level. You need to take it internationally and you need to show people um, how to retreat, how to heal, how to have time away so they can actually retreat and be whole. You know, go away, you know, be supported and then come back come back from those experiences, rejuvenated, refreshed, and whole. And so this year we're launching the Black Women's Leaders Retreat, which has been the evolution of the work of Project Resiliency Movement to, up to this point. Let me meditate again. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of information, a lot of questions on this side, just about the powerful work that you're doing. And, you know, what, what sits on my heart is that... Um, God is at the head of your board of directors for how you navigate your business. And it sounds like the Project Resiliency Movement sort of took over, became more of a full-time thing than the consulting. Honestly, it has driven, let me just tell you what has happened. So it has driven the work for Abates Consulting. So as a result of Project Resiliency Movement, I was dealing with so many women that were um, in process of letting go of their baggage and their brokenness. And because I was actually the, the first, you know, the, the second year we did like a baggage claim conference and a year of baggage claim. So I had women like coming to different events and they were letting go of baggage and let, you know, pour, pouring it out. But then they wanted to work with me to say, okay, well, how, what do I do now that I've let go of the baggage? How do I reclaim my life? How do I rebuild the, you know, rebuild myself and, and, and get into what my purpose too. Can you help me with that? And so it kind of became the driver for the work that Abates Consultants started doing. So I, I kind of had to shift from what I was doing before with the consulting work in terms of like the workforce development work um, and had that, have, you know, in the uh, youth development work and, and having that be the drivers kind of consulting with nonprofits. It shifted the work to doing a lot of um, individual coaching with women around, primarily women around resiliency and self-care and doing resiliency coaching and wellness coaching. So it, it became the driver for the work that Abates Consultants started to do. That's amazing. Yeah. So tell us, because you told us about God directing your <laughs> steps to the resiliency movement. So when did you listen and make the break from your nine to five to say, okay, right. I'm doing, because I know you gave up on the, the <laughs> PhD. Yeah. When did you make that shift to say, okay, I am going to walk into my purpose with the resiliency movement and, right. uh, and say, and, and step out on faith and, you know, talk to us yeah. about risk. Sure. It's risk. It's, it's a risky thing. So I actually, you know, I, I say this all the time to people when I go present, especially women, I said, you know, sometimes we, you know, um, we have the, we make decisions, but God has plans for our lives, you know? So we have decisions for the things that we think we want to do, or we know we want to do, but God has a plan. And so my decision that I had made was, you know, after the, 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 the third year of doing the conference, it was amazing. We had like that year, we had 400 women come and, and it was a phenomenal life-changing experience um, that we had that year, um, the baggage claim conference. And I was just, you know, you know, I was just kind of in awe and, you know, I was kind of really, really processing, okay, well, what next? You know, we had this amazing event, amazing, you know, you know, and I was like, God, it's getting more difficult to balance all the things that are coming at me, the opportunities to speak, the opportunities to do coaching, um, the, you know, all the, all the opportunities that are coming. I started writing, getting opportunities to write books around resiliency and self-care as a result of the work. And it was like all these opportunities are coming and the time is getting, you know, 
it's getting harder to crunch the time in around the nine to five or the things that I'm doing. So it was, I did a lot of sleepless nights because I was like, I, you know, I, you know, I would sleep for two hours and then get up, get my kids ready, get them to school and then go to work. Uh, and then I would, every, every opportunity during work, I was actually doing something. So 15 minute breaks, I was actually doing stuff for Project Resiliency Movement at A-Base Consulting. I was, you know, uh, during my hour lunch, doing, you know, working on A-Base, you know. So at work, I was doing the other work in between the times that I actually had as breaks. I didn't even, I never had breaks. Every chance I got, I was doing something. I would have lunch meetings, coaching sessions for an hour during my lunch, my lunch time for my nine to five. Um, you know, so I was just trying to work every bit of time that I possibly could. And I had, made, I made a decision after the, the, la, the, the, the conference, that conference, that I was like, okay, well, um, I'm going to try to create an exit strategy for myself because this is going so well and I'm getting so many opportunities that I might as well just do my passion work that fuels me instead of the work that I have to do. Um, and so I made an exit strategy that would actually leave the following fall before the next conference came up that November. And I said, okay, God, so, you know, if it's, if it's your desire for me to do this, you'll create the means, you'll create the ways, you'll, you'll continue to send people to me that I can help um, through coaching, et cetera. And I actually um, took two weeks off after that last conference in November that I did, the, um, the Baggage Cape Conference. And when I came back to work that Monday, my supervisor said, I need to, she sent me an email saying, I need to meet with you first thing Monday when you come back, um, <clears throat> back to work. I went in Monday morning at 8 p.m. for a meeting. And she said, you know, Althea, we looked at the budget going into this next year. Um, and I had already lost two, two staff persons because the grants that we had for their, their projects, um, we didn't get, they didn't get renewed. So I'd lost two, I was down two staff people as a director. And she said, we looked at the budget and, you know, the, the, the streamlines and, and the, the sources that we thought, the grants we thought were gonna, that were going to come in to support your um, position, um, we didn't get those grants. So unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. And I said, okay, when do I need to leave by? It was almost like I was, it was the weirdest thing. I was, it was almost like I, a guy had prepared me to be thinking about exiting, but I thought the exit was going to be the following fall. But God was like preparing me to prepare to leave right, right away. Like I didn't realize it was going to be like right away, you know, and, um, so I was processing exiting, but it was much sooner than I, I had made a decision to exit. And honestly, God knew best because I would have missed out on so many opportunities that happened for 2017 that moved the work for Project Resiliency and A-Base Consulting forward. Um, you know, speaking engagements, opportunities to be a part of, um, of uh, initiatives and collaborations. Um, you know, um, you know, more, more work that, that we launched around creating a residency, um, uh, you know, we're creating, um, the residency Institute, which I'm launching, um, at the end of this year, um, the op- opportunity after opportunity that I would have missed, um, if I was still working the nine to five. So he knew best. He had to move me and push me out into the deep, um, b- because my exit strategy was, was too comfortable. I was giving myself a year to prep everything to then exit. And he said, no, I've got to launch you into the deep now um, so you can do the work and so you can get, you know, you, you can get the opportunities that, that you have that are coming to you right now in process in real time. And I, I'm thankful that he actually, um, I think it's the opportunity. I said, I don't tell people I wasn't laid off. I got an opportunity to no longer work a nine to five. And I'm thankful that God gave me that opportunity every single day. No regrets. Um, of course, your first year as an entrepreneur doing the full-time work is always a hard transition. And I would never lie to anyone and say, oh, it was, it's been great. It's been, you know, it's been all roses and glitters and rainbows. But I would say that it, it was worth it. Everything that I've, um, I've been able to do, it was worth all the struggles that I had, especially my first year in that transition. Um, because, of course, you, you, you know, you no longer have that nine-to-five salary. Mm-hmm. So now you have to create, you have to create your means of income. You have to create your different streamlines of, of, of bringing in funds into, you, into, into supporting whatever work you, you want to do. So now I've created enough streams of income for myself and diversifying those streams of income so I can have time to do the work that I really love to do. That pa- my passion project work, which is project resiliency work, which is consulting and coaching women um, to take their lives back, um, to get unstuck. 
um, to move beyond whatever, whatever, you know, baggage or brokenness that they might have been in and to heal from those things and move forward. So those things give me passion. Those things drive me. That's, that's how I get the energy to do all the things that I'm doing. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, you know, my, my, my seven year old, she's now eight was watching myself and my husband, who's also an entrepreneur. He owns a barbershop and um, runs a photography studio, watching us hustle and make moves and do things. And sometimes, you know, childcare being what it was, I would bring her to meetings with me, uh, you know, and say, and say, sit, you got your iPad, chill out, mommy's got a meeting. And she watched me. She watched me conduct meetings. She watched me do coaching sessions. She watched me, um, you, know, um, you know, lead a group of women that were for planning a conference. Um, she, you know, so she watched me do all these dynamics and then said, said, you know, listen, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm ready to do this. And I was like, what? Yeah. You're only seven. <laughs> ready to do what? <laughs> you know, and it, it, but, but honestly watching her journey evolve and, and watching her kind of cocoon out of, you know, into like, you know, a little butterfly. Um, and I, I, you know, you guys think I'm, I, you know, I'm, um, you know, a, mo- a mogul she's, she's a mini mogul and a half. Like she's, she's, she's teaching me things about how to handle my business, you know? Wow. <laughs> and I watch her and it's amazing. It's amazing that, you know, you can, and what she's taught me is that you're never too, people say you're never too old to accomplish or your goals or your dreams, or your visions. She's taught me that it's, you're never too young. You're never too young to start achieving or, or accomplishing your goals, dreams, and visions. And so honestly, she gives, she gives me in, in, inspiration with her, you know, with her doing the work that she's doing as well. I'm inspired. I, I, I have a three-year-old and I'm wondering, <laughs> for the sake of curiosity, at what age did you start pulling her into the fold with seeing what you're doing? Honestly, she's, she's been with me. Uh, she's been with me through my entire journey process. So um, I started, to give you, the, you know, a little backdrop. I started doctoral school when she was three months old. So I didn't have time to read, um, you know, um, you know, any, any of the kids books that, you know, that you would know, like Good Night Moon and, you know, all those, I didn't have time for that. Cause I, you know, the time that I had, I had to use it wisely. So I was reading my textbooks to her, you know, like when, for story time, you know? And so that, that we, at nighttime, I pull out my, my te- textbooks for one of my classes <laughs> and I would do my reading to her as she went to sleep. So she never grew, you know, she, it's crazy because, you know, I tell people that dynamic so, so they can kind of get who she is and, and maybe give a little context for maybe why she's the way she is. Um, yeah, so she never, I never had time to do the, the, um, the children's book. So I read my textbooks there. So she was reading like, I was, re- she was getting like doctoral level textbook knowledge, <laughs> you know, as, as a, <laughs> yeah, probably pretty much soon. So, you know, and, and, um, I was, I, I would actually, um, have classes and stuff on the weekends. So she would actually have to go with me. I would go into the office. She had her snacks for the day. I would set her up. Um, and, and I had my schedule for the day that I would get my work done. I would do my conference calls from there. I would, you know, I would, I would work. And so she saw me at a very young age and cause I didn't have a babysitter. So she, I, 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 I you know, I created my own childcare situation for her. She had, she had her own toys at my office. We had snack time, you know, we, we go into the break room, she'd get her snack, I would go, then I would come back, go to work. And I did a nine to five, basically every Saturday and Sunday. I didn't have days off because I was working full time and then actually going to doctoral school full time. So there were no days off. And so she saw me in that hustling grind from a very young age, um, you know, kind of being with me all the time, um, especially um, on the weekends, seeing me kind of get my, my um, work on my dissertation and work on my doctoral degree. So she, there's never been a time where she hasn't seen me doing some form of, of hustling, I guess, you know, when she hasn't seen me grinding in some type of way. And her father's the same thing, you know? So there were times where I, I you know, I, I had meetings and stuff and she would have to go to her dad's barbershop and watch him, you know, cut here and, you know, and interact and, you know, work with his clients. So she, that's the environment that she's always been in. So she's never seen a parent, um, one of her parents, like not necessarily working or not necessarily working for themselves. Right. So it's, it's, I think for her, it's like automatic. So, you know, you know, we, when we asked her, what do you want to do? And what do you want to be? She's like, well, you know, I, I like to give massages. So I, you know, why not, why not open up a massage, massage spa? And then, so, you know, even with her business, 
she um she she wanted to learn. She was into. She's always been into hair and like learning about hair, caring for hair, pr- what products to use for hair. And I always wanted to try things on her dolls. And then my hairdresser would actually have her um, go in, try things. And so she said, Auntie Debbie, you always have me trying these different things. What if I what if I actually created a business where I had girls that I would bring the girls and you would teach other girls what you taught me how to take care of their dogs here. And she said, the goal would really be, so by the time we, we need to take care of our hair when we're a little older, we know what products to use. We know how to, you know, we know, we know what, to, how, what to do to keep our hair healthy. And, and so she came up with a business plan, just kind of having a conversation. And we made her write it down. And, and, and then she, she, and we said, if you can write it down and then come up with a name, then we'll, we'll make it a business. And she, she sat for an hour on the laptop and wrote everything down, all the ideas, and then came back with the, with the ideas and, and the name and said, okay, here's everything I want to do. Um, and to Debbie, you'll, you'll, you'll help me do the tutorials, so you'll demonstrate how to do the hair tutorials. I'll bring the kids and I'll plan the event, and we'll work together on it, and then this is how the events will be planned. This is how it will be structured. These are the type of things we'll do at the events. At um, seven. At seven, at seven. <laughs> and she said, I want to launch, just worse, I want to launch my first event before I go to Florida to my grandma for a vacation, which is, that she, she gave us a deadline. This is May. We had, we had the, this, this, this interaction with her. She gave us a deadline to, to launch her conference before she went at the end of June to her grandmother. So we, she launched her first conference, um, her first event, um, June 15th last year. And she said, I want 20 girls there. And this is how much I want them to pay. And this is what they'll receive. I want everybody to have a swag bag. And this is what I want them to walk away with. And I want, and she said, Auntie Debbie, you're in charge of getting products because our hairdresser is a representative for Design Essentials. So she said, you're in charge of getting products and samples for the swag bags. And she said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and everything happened. And her entire, we just, we orchestrated her entire plan. And she had, she had 30 girls at her first event. It was phenomenal. Wow. I, I am inspired. I, I should be taking notes. From your <laughs> That's what I, I take notes from her. She, you know, she, she tells us when she, she, she needs to have a meeting. She said, I need to have a business meeting. Call Auntie Debbie now and schedule it. Like, you know, so I, I'm her secretary. <laughs> nice. nice, nice, nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm her secretary in, in addition to having my own businesses. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is a lot to juggle. So what would yeah. you say is the formula for owning your career? I think the formula for owning your career is, is, is change. It's really changing your mindset, honestly, about, um, it's really changing your mindset. So it's, it's basically, how do you want to trade your time? You know, looking at what, what's important to you, where do you want to spend your energies and your time? And if your energies and your time are not being spent currently in what you're doing, then, then it's really a shift in your mindset as to how you can go about changing that. So when I made the decision that I no longer wanted to spend the majority of my time working somebody else's nine to five business, um, and that I wanted to work my own business to have more time to invest in my, in my children and my family, um, and my passion projects, then it, it really then addressed, um, you know, how, how I would go about achieving or accomplishing or attaining that. And so I began to kind of take steps. Um, in terms of like launching, you know, then my nonprofit, you know, work, actually added more components to my um, consulting business to be able to make that dream a reality um, for myself. But for me, it started with a mindset shift in terms of how I wanted to spend my time. And I didn't, I no longer wanted to trade my time for dollars. Because time is precious. Time is an investment and time is precious. I wanted to have control over how my time was spent as opposed to, as opposed to having to go to work and it being controlled by somebody else. Mm-hmm. So for me, it, it began with a mindset shift as to how I, I wanted to spend my time. And then that began the plan to then actualize how to get to, the, to, to move myself to, to being able to actualize that plan where my time was in control and, and how I spent it, I had control of it. What tools and resources did you use to help you get your mindset where it needed to be to be successful? Honestly, I invested in coaching. I am a coach, but the best coaches have coaches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and I mean, and, 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 if, and if they don't, then you need to question that coach. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because the best coaches invest in coaching. They also have to up their level. They also have to get information 
to support their own personal or, or professional journeys. Um, and so I invested in coaching and it, it was money well worthwhile. Um, I invested in, um, in, in, in um, uh, somebody that I, um, that somebody referred me to who was a strategic, um, a strategic coach, you know, so, um, and also a strategic business, uh, a strategic coach, but also a strategic business coach. Mm. So how to actually um, maximize or build the capacity of your business so you no longer have to actually rely on your nine to five streams of income. She taught me how to do that, um, how to expand and, you know, how to expand and also without, without actually extending myself, how to expand and grow my business so then I would no longer be relying on my nine to five business as, you know, or if I didn't have it anymore, it wouldn't be an issue. Mm-hmm. So she began to, to teach me how to slowly do that um, and how to fuel my nonprofit project residency how to fuel the individuals I was impacting in that business, how to move those clients into my coaching business. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. smart. Yeah. So um, tell us about uh, taking risk. Because you've taken a lot of risk. I've taken a lot. Of, I leap. So honestly, you know, Steve Harvey's book is amazing. Um, but I was kind of, you know, I was, it was, I was, I was doing it without knowing the formula. And then when I read Steve Harvey's book, you know, Leap or Jump, it was like, okay, that's what I've kind of been doing. And without me realizing that it was like a whole theory or formula behind it, that's kind of what I was doing. So what I started to do, honestly, was everything that, that made me actually want sweat or come into a cold sweat or actually made my armpit sweat, I made a decision to do it. So everything I that. that I changed my, my mindset around um, and I also, I eliminated failure. That's the other thing I did. So I eliminated, and, and I just actually did a, um, a talk on, on that, on a, a, my local TV station that it was called, um, how to find wins and failure. And so what I talked about, what I talked about was, um, uh, honestly, how do you, um, find wins and failure. So what I talked about was I took away the possibility of, of, of failure for myself and, and gave myself opportunities to learn lessons from whatever I did. So there, so there's things that I, there, there's wins that I got. And then there's some things that I, I didn't win at by taking that, that jump or that leap. But guess what? I still learned something from what I did, what, you know, what that was, whatever that was that, I, that, that was not, that didn't turn out that great. It's something that I got out of it. So I, I changed my mindset around failure and say, there's no failure. If I actually just have, if I just leap and take a chance and, and, and opportunities before me, if by my leaping, I'm aligning myself with, with what I need to be doing. And so if, you know, there, for me, there is no failure. There's only wins. I only look at, now I look at, okay, there's an opportunity for me to win even in, even in the things that I don't necessarily um, attain or, or, or meet the bar of expectation that I held for myself around that thing. I still learned something. I've still grown from that. It taught me something. It's prepared me for the next thing that I have to do. So there's no, there's no losses. Well said. It reminds me, I was thinking when you were talking about Leap, I think of Shonda Rhimes and her book about saying yes. And she did a year of saying yes to opportunities and just the growth. And as I yes. Know, and so that's what I've been doing. I'm, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. So that's the other thing I did. So people, you know, so all the things that would make me extremely afraid to do, or I don't have the capacity, I feel like I don't have the capacity to do, I don't have the resources to get it done. I don't, you know, all the things that would, I would overanalyze and not, and, and kind of like stay stagnant or not move on because I, I was overanalyzing those things. I don't have the resources, the capacity, or I don't know if I'm actually even skilled enough in that thing. If the opportunity presents itself now, I say yes. When you ask me even to be on this podcast, I said, yes, sure. I say yes. So any possibility that presents itself in my life that crosses my path, I believe is for me. So if it crosses my path and, and, it, and, and, I, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm in line and I'm in movement and I'm in action and I'm in process, if, those, if I'm in movement and I'm in alignment and I'm in process and I'm in action towards my goals and what I'm trying to accomplish, things will, pa- will, will cross my path that I need to align with. And when it crosses my path, it's my job 
to leap into those opportunities and those things and say yes. It's my obligation because that thing is what I need to, to then get me to wherever else I'm trying to get to mm-hmm. along the path that I'm moving on. And so I changed my mindset to that very same form of thinking that if I don't leap, then I'm going to hinder the thing that's supposed to come next. There are lots of meditative moments in this interview where (laughs) we just have to let silence do the work. There's some powerful uh, nuggets of wisdom that you're dropping here. And that's, uh, it's so true. And and it's resonating with me and the work that I do as well. So uh, tell us what advice would you give to someone wanting to successfully own their career? So honestly, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, it, the, the, when I, I started to take ownership of my career, even while I was at working my nine to five. So what I would say is don't be afraid to own the reins of what you want to do, even while you're working for somebody else. Build whatever you want to do on the back of whatever you're currently doing. Don't wait to leave a nine to five or don't leave your nine to five to build your business, build it while, build the ship while you're getting paid by somebody else. Tell our listeners uh, how they can get in touch with you. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm available um, on Twitter, um, Instagram, let's see, um, Facebook. Um, I can be accessed at Project Resiliency Movement on um, Instagram and um, Facebook. Uh, and on Twitter, it's um, at Proj, P-R-O-J-R-E-S, Movement. Um, let's see. On, on Facebook, I have a personal page, Althea Weber Bates. And um, my website is www.abatesconsulting.org. That's www.abatesconsulting.org. On there, you can find all my services, products, um, the work that I do, information about me. Etc. Awesome. Well, I have certainly enjoyed this conversation so much. You have poured into me, uh, you know, like little plugs to really lean back into my faith more on the journey. And I appreciate that. I think the listeners are going to get so much wisdom from you just being transparent and inspiring and motivating and all that good stuff. So, um, I hope to talk to you again. And thank you so much for being a guest on the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. Absolutely, Simone. It was my pleasure. And even I would love to connect with you even beyond this. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Thank you for listening to the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. It is my hope that you enjoyed today's episode. You can check out the show notes for this episode on the Simone Morris Enterprises.org website by clicking the podcast menu. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and tell a friend or two about it. 